Hi everyone, welcome back to History 102, uh, Section 12, online, uh, with myself, Dr. Ross, uh, and Dr. Haynes. Uh, today's lecture is going to pick up right where Dr. Haynes left us with his tour around the world in 1500, uh, with the discussion of the emergence or the beginnings of the Age of Exploration. Uh, the place that people were trying to get to when they went out exploring, uh, Ming China, and the importance of the Indian Ocean trade um, to that process. Now, as a reminder, Dr. Haynes last time explained that one reason we begin around the year 1500 in this course is in order to trace three big themes in world history that began to drastically change around that moment. First, the emergence of strong states and a state-based international system. Second, the emergence of a world economic system that linked the world together. And third, the link between these two processes that led to the emergence of new forms of inequality both within individual states and between them. In the next few lectures, essentially the first part of your course, that will be the subject of your first exam, we're going to trace these three themes through the quote-unquote age of discovery, or better, a little bit, the age of exploration. Why? Because in many ways these three major changes in world history begin as Western Europeans seek out new sources of wealth, converts to Christianity, and personal glory in the 15th century. In fact, it's precisely when Europeans begin strengthening their own states that they begin to seek out new ways of establishing their own power outside of Europe, and it is precisely as Europeans begin stretching outside of Europe that other places in the world get tied together in a single economic system, largely under uh, and for the benefit of Europeans. It is with Europe's eventual success at spreading itself across the world that new forms of inequality will emerge and that it, it essentially much of the world will be uh, uh, under the thumb of European powers. So today I'm going to do two things. First, I'm going to introduce what the Age of Exploration itself was, with an emphasis on the motivations that drew Europeans to break out of their tiny peninsula on the Eurasian continent and begin exploring the rest of the world with more intensity than they had before. And second, I'm going to emphasize the importance of the European decision to do so to a contrast with the decisions made by the most powerful empire in the world at the year 1500, that of China. As we shall see, the decision by Europeans to go forth and find new cultures and seek out wealth and conquer others, combined with the Chinese decision to stay put, to close off, to essentially promote their own stability, rather than conquer others, had great ramifications for the narrative of world history. So, we'll begin with the Age of Exploration. The Age of Exploration represents the period that began in the 16th century, where Europeans did two things. First, they gave Europeans increasing access to new markets over here in Asia, the major focus of the second half of this lecture, and they created an entirely new market here in the New World, the subject of Dr. Haynes's lecture, uh, lectures really on Thursday and next week. So note at the outset that my definition of the age of exploration is linked to the emergence of an economic system based around markets that Europeans wanted 
raw materials to create their own goods, and they wanted to be able to buy the goods of others, namely those located in East and Southeast Asia. The age of exploration was carried out by individuals, promoted by states and private um, uh, enterprises. It was carried out by adventurers, traders, soldiers, and later these adventurers would be called conquistadors, conquerors. A nomenclature, a naming, that illustrates how quickly the age of exploration becomes an age of conquest. Some of these men's names are probably already familiar to you. I will talk a bit about Christopher Columbus, but also Ferdinand Magellan, Vasco da Gama, perhaps Henry Hudson. Others are less known, such as Bartolomeu Diaz, the Portuguese explorer, but nonetheless uh, important. No matter what differences divided these men, no matter why particular states or enterprises decided to promote their voyages, all set sail into far-flung areas of the world, you can see with this map and all the, the arrows, for the same reasons. Unfortunately, those easy reasons are easy to remember. Uh, God, gold, and glory. All wanted to convert, to spread Christianity, to find monetary wealth, the gold, and glory, to glorify their own uh, bravery and image. The results of the Age of Exploration, where we will end this part of the course, not this lecture, but this part of the course, is the rise of a global economic system that integrated the Americas and Africa, which made the Atlantic much more central to world history at the expense of the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean. And, perhaps more importantly, or as importantly, the rise of empire and the control of European powers, first the Portuguese and the Spanish, then the British, Dutch, and the French, over vast parts of the world. So let's begin with a story, one you probably already know. In order to get at some of the themes that are so central to an understanding of what the Age of Exploration was. Hopefully, there we go, uh, with Christopher Columbus. Uh, as you already know, Christopher Columbus uh, sailed the ocean blue in 1492. I might have that reverse, uh, reversed, um, and discovered, quote unquote, the Americas, a term that would have been quite the surprise to those who had already lived here. Christopher Columbus grew up in Genoa, in Italy, where he saw and heard firsthand tales of great wealth by the merchants who uh, uh, arrived from traveling the Indian Ocean and Asia. As a young man, he joined a crew of a merchant ship and settled in Portugal in his 20s and supported himself by making maps. While in Portugal, he had many opportunities to visit uh, other places as the Portuguese began to expand out of their uh, 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 site in Western Europe. Columbus immersed himself in reading both the classics and medieval travel accounts in order to develop his own theory of the size and shape of the world. Now let's note, People during Columbus's time understood that the world was round. The debate was whether and how far Europe was, excuse me, to Asia. So over here is Portugal, where Columbus was. Over here is what he thought Asia was. And his goal was rather than sailing east, but in, it, he would instead sail west. Columbus, as you can see from this map, was a bit off on his 
geography. He vastly underestimated the distance between the western tip of Europe and the eastern part of Asia. Which explains why Columbus had so much difficulty getting anyone to fund his voyages. Because people knew better than he did. However, in the year 1492, fresh off their success conquering the, the, the rest of the Spanish peninsula, uh, the Spanish king and queen, Ferdinand uh, and Isabella, uh, decided to fund Columbus's journey. Convinced by his claims that he would be able to locate and access the vast wealth of Asia and bring it back to them. These incredibly Catholic and Christian monarchs were also quite convinced by Columbus's own faith and his own destiny, revealed by the meaning of his name, meaning Christ carrier, that he would bring in, uh, Christianity and convert the peoples of Japan and China and India during his voyage. Things did not quite work out the way uh, Columbus hoped. Uh, setting sail west out of Europe, he expected to arrive uh, in Asia. Instead, he lands in the Caribbean. Uh, uh, without, for the record, realizing uh, he did so. Uh, hence the name uh, Indians uh, uh, for India that he uh, granted to the peoples uh, he encountered there. Um, the first island that Columbus landed on, he named San Salvador, Spanish for Holy Savior. And he was certain that while there, the peoples he encountered were Indians. And he kept trying to find a way off of this island, so here's San Salvador, and onto what he believed was mainland China. Not being able to do so, because he wasn't in Asia, uh, Columbus does go back uh, 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 to Spain, uh, bringing tales of what he saw, of the wealth that he imagined must be there, and importantly, bringing back with him several of the native peoples he encountered there. The first encounters between Columbus and the Native Americans of the Americas represents, in many respects, what the age of exploration would lead to going forward. There's a possibly apocryphal story of Columbus's first encounter with these people, the Tainos, in which Columbus, showing them the weapons that Europeans had brought with them, but not meaning to attack, um, the Indians reached out and grabbed the steel sword by the blade, cutting themselves. This accidental act of violence foreshadowed the great destruction that the arrival of Europeans would lead to for the peoples of the Caribbean. And yet, you know, that's in some ways foreshadowing a lecture to come. The reason I begin my lecture uh, of the Age of Exploration for Columbus is the way that he encapsulates, the way that he um, brings together major themes of the Age of Exploration, and in particular, the place of Asia in that Age of Exploration more broadly. Columbus was not trying to discover new lands. Europeans were not trying to discover new lands. Europeans also were not trying to conquer any new lands. In fact, they didn't know that new lands were there to be conquered. Rather, Columbus and his compatriots were seeking a more direct route to the far richer, far more powerful, and to be frank, far more important uh, empires and states of Asia. That it's actually the great wealth of Asia, not necessarily or not simply the internal desires of Europeans that drives the great explosion 
of discovery and exploration uh, that begins in the 15th century. So that raises the question. Europeans know where Asia is. Right? It's quite large. It's to their uh, east. Right? They know where it is. They know it has stuff they want. Why was it necessary in the first place for Columbus and others like him to sail west? Why did they need to go west to find new routes in order to access Asia? And it's to that question that I'm going to now turn by talking a bit about China in particular, the richest and most powerful uh, empire of the time, and really would remain so until uh, really the 18th century, the 17, 1700s. So, one thing to note about uh, Asia, the late, or really, let's say, the, 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 the 15th century, um, Asia, like many other places in the Eurasian continent, has to recover from an event that Dr. Haynes mentioned and that those of you who took 101 will be familiar with, uh, the Black Death. That just like European societies, China in particular, but also uh, to some extent North Africa, had to find a way of rebuilding after the destruction of the plague that ravaged the Eurasian continent in the 14th century. And Asia, in many respects, recovers first, before Europe had been able to. And in fact, it's Asia's ability, or China, excuse me, China's particular ability to recover that places it at the center of an emerging global trade, here based around the Indian Ocean. The place, in other words, that Europeans so want to get to. In the course of the 15th century, or excuse me, 14th and 15th century, the new main empire, as this uh, recovered China will be called, becomes the strongest in the world. So what explains Chinese strength, and what explains Chinese uh, uh, recovery, and what explains the desire of Europeans to get to China in the first place? Um, first thing to note about Ming China and why it was so powerful and why people wanted to get there is that they had the largest population in the world. China around this time, during the Ming uh, Empire, had about 65 million people in it. And China, unlike a lot of other places, had vast agricultural resources to support this population. China could be, in many respects, self-sufficient. So first reason that China is so important or so powerful is its population. Second is that China has the most efficient bureaucracy in the world. Its government was the most efficient in the world. This efficiency ensured political stability in China between these three set uh, between in these three centuries of the Ming Dynasty will rule. This is related for the record to one of your uh, uh, readings for today, the description of the Chinese educational system. That text describing uh, uh, the way in which Chinese children learn to read is significant not simply for what it tells us about the method, but for what it tells us about the importance that Chinese authorities put on education as a way of ensuring that they would have a well-trained and educated governing class. The grandeur of China was well represented by its palaces, such as, and most importantly, the Forbidden Palace in the capital. This palace which was constructed by over 100,000 artisans and 1 million laborers was, as, it, as its name implies, uh, forbidden to all of the populace except the royal family. By placing such an uh, uh, extravagant, grand, dominating structure at the center of political power, the Ming emperors were able to demonstrate to all who saw it their 
total and complete dominance over the country. In doing so, they were able to ensure that that efficient bureaucracy that they uh, uh, created remained loyal to them. So, we think of, uh, to, uh, to review just uh, briefly, China is incredibly well situated. It has a great population. It has a huge agricultural resources that can feed that population. Its population is well educated. It knows how to train its population to serve. And the sheer power of the emperors ensure that such service was given, if not willingly, uh, certainly the emperors were not um, uh, uh, adverse to using violence. In fact, the first Ming emperor uh, murdered his own prime minister in order to rule the country more directly. Um, their ability to represent themselves ensured loyalty amongst the population. So the Ming are in an interesting position once we reach the 14th century. So if I just go back to, you, to your dates, uh, the Ming Dynasty is founded after the fall of the Mongols during the Black Death um, uh, in the mid-14th century. By the early 15th century, the Ming Dynasty has essentially stabilized and established itself as the most powerful empire uh, in the world for the uh, reasons I already stated. That political stability endowed Ming China with great opportunity. Ming China uh, uh, lay, as you can tell by the map, at the center of a flourishing trade network into which other countries, very powerful ones such as India, which you read about but I will not cover today, the Ottoman Empire, which I'll cover in a later lecture, uh, and East Africa are plugged in. Ming China, in other words, is poised to dominate the central trade networks of, uh, uh, at the time. And indeed, China possessed all the stuff that everyone else who could afford it wanted. China was making and producing the goods that were in high demand by other areas of the world. India, yes, that participated in the production of spices, but also served as one of the kind of uh, areas where the, uh, as go-betweens of the, the goods that China was producing, but also, most of all, Europe. We wanted access to the spices, the silk, the cotton that was available in Asia and Southeast Asia. Perhaps most famously, uh, uh, Ming porcelain was, val was highly desired by Europeans and others throughout, uh, throughout the world. And so some of you might have seen uh, reproductions of these very beautiful uh, Ming uh, 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 pots, uh, vases, um, that people wanted so desperately to have. The Ming, however, didn't really see much benefit in trade. Uh, the Ming, as I already said, were the most powerful country in the world. They had the agricultural resources they needed to survive. They didn't need to buy stuff from, uh, buy food from others. They had a stable government. They, in fact, often thought that trade would have destabilizing effects on their own, um, on their own uh, stability. So Ming China is a really interesting case of a country that has all the, all the power and possibility of expansion, of engaging with the rest of the world, but deciding not to. Of essentially deciding, actually, we're pretty good with the stability we have now. Let's not rock the boat. Let's, let's, let's keep things uh, as they were. So I have two examples about this. Uh, uh, about this, this tension that Ming China is in. On the one hand, an example that illustrates the power of Ming China in the 15th century, and the fact that they could have, if they wanted, been the place that went elsewhere. And then a second example, to represent Ming China's e eventual decision to not do so. To essentially give a path to Europeans 
to expand themselves. So, example one. Ming China uh, uh, thinks about exploring. They think about leaving home. In the early 15th century, the Ming, just recovering from the Black Death, decide that they need to assert themselves in the Indian Ocean. That the Ming decide, essentially, that they need their neighbors to know that they are on top, that they should not be challenged. Therefore, they decide to send out a Ming military leader named Zheng Ha to travel the Indian Ocean, trade a little bit, but really to collect tribute from neighboring states and demonstrate China's power to the world. Tribute simply means a gift made under duress, right? A, a gift at gunpoint. So Zheng Ha is sent out to demonstrate Chinese power in the Indian Ocean. And from 1405 till his death in 1433, he does so. During this time, Ha commands the world's largest and most powerful armada, and led in total seven naval expeditions. So to give you a sense uh, of what this means and what I, what I mean when I say that this example represents Chinese power and their ability to extend themselves across the world, um, this big boat is Zen Ha's, and I hope you can see, I will uh, post this PowerPoint, uh, this little boat is Columbus's flagship. So, Zen Ha has, has the bigger boat, <laughs> uh, to put it, to put it uh, in uh, terms that are current. Uh, Zen Ha could dominate European powers. His ships stretched 400 feet in length, and each one carried hundreds of sailors on four tiers of decks, maneuvered with sophisticated rudders, nine masts, his first expedition set sail with 62 ships and 200 smaller ones. Uh, I, I assume you know how many Columbus set sail with. Zhang Ha set sail with 28,000 men, all pledged to promote Ming dominance over the Indian Ocean. So here's a map of Zhang Ha's uh, voyages from 14, uh, 1405 to 1433. As he visits all these places, he seeks not territorial expansion like uh, his European compatriots later in the century will, will but rather tribute. Zhang Ha, while he's out uh, ex uh, exploring the Indian Ocean, collects ivory, spices, ointments, etc., etc., from his neighbors including some exotic animals, such as giraffes, and he brings them back to China to demonstrate that they could. That they were so powerful that they could man these things of their neighbors and bring them back. And no one could do anything about it. If a place refused, Zheng Ha would simply attack it. And encourage, quote unquote, encourage the rulers of these smaller nations in Southeast Asia to come visit China and just see how powerful they are, uh, uh, in fact. So, China in the early 15th century seems to be expanding outward. It certainly could do so. There, in fact, is no reason whatsoever that after these voyages they couldn't simply go the opposite direction and find North America, or, the, uh, uh, or Central America themselves. But they don't. And that's what's so important. That Zheng Ha's um, voyages are a representation of, Ming's uh, of the Ming Dynasty's power, but also a lost opportunity, if we want to turn it, turn it that. With Zheng Ha's death, China decides that actually this isn't worth the effort. 
that they don't need to do this. I mean, that's how powerful they really are. That all of this demand for tribute, all of that trade that they could have access to, wasn't worth the trouble. And instead, they turn inward. They turn inward. And that's example number two. The representation of Chinese decision to not expand outward, but rather to look internally. The Great Wall of China. Now, the Great Wall of China, uh, uh, the, the building of the Great Wall of China began before the Ming Dynasty, but it was completed, uh, if you one could say it was ever completed, by the Ming. The Great Wall of China was built to keep out invading, quote unquote, barbarians. It was begun in the second century uh, and culminated in 15,000 miles uh, of, uh, uh, of structure. In, uh, during the Ming Empire. Some of its uh, uh, portions reached a height of 35 feet and 20 feet across. The wall was built in large measure for military reasons. They wanted to keep out invasion. They wanted to protect their people. But it's more important as a representation of Ming China's mentality as they complete it. That even though they could send out warships, even though they could send out their military, they decide not to. And in fact, they literally enclose themselves in a wall. Literally. So it's not simply the physical structure that's interesting, it's what it means for world history. This is a turning point. The construction of a Great Wall represents the Ming's unwillingness and undesire to engage with its neighbors for both good and bad, right? It didn't, while on the one hand that means it won't conquer anyone, on the other, it's not going to have, uh, it's not going to encounter new ideas, it's not going to encounter new goods, and it's not going to encounter uh, uh, except under duress, new religions. China will eventually suffer for this decision. Its unwillingness to adapt and engage with others will eventually be, in part at least, its downfall. For now, however, it remains, at this point in our story, the most powerful uh, country or empire in the world. So this leaves us, if we, if, if we return to the beginning of my lecture, leaves us with an interesting quandary. Um, Ming China has everything that everyone wants. But in the late 19th, or excuse me, late 15th century, China wasn't that willing to give anyone any of its stuff, right? It built a literal wall to ensure that you couldn't get to it. So what, is, uh, what are people who want to engage with trade with China to do? They are going to have to find ways of getting access to Chinese stuff. That's the whole point. That's the whole goal. Getting access to China's stuff. And this requires a couple things. I mean, A, it requires quicker access to the markets available in the Indian Ocean, right? So that's the route. But it will also necessitate showing that you too have some ability to demand the stuff that you want, whether they want to give it to you or not. So, most of the trade that Europeans and others want access to is occurring here, as I've already said, in the Indian Ocean. Their attempt to access to China has to go through these broader trade networks uh, through which India and the Ottoman Empire remain quite important. While China could have been the dominant power in the Indian Ocean, its decision to close off leaves an opening for others to intervene. First, uh, uh, India, then the Ottomans, and finally, uh, for the purposes of our story perhaps, the most important, the Europeans. Now one could ask, if it was so important for Europeans over here to get to China, why they had to go through the ocean? Why they had to go through the sea? 
Um, well, that's because they wanted to avoid going through the Middle East. The Middle East contained a number of Islamic empires, which you will uh, read about, but we will not spend too much time in lecture, uh, lecture on. Uh, suffice it to say, uh, these Islamic empires were considered enemies of Europe, which was primarily Christian. And Ottomans, or excuse me, uh, the Ottoman Empire in particular, liked to tax all of these trade routes quite heavily. So Europeans who wanted to find a quicker, more efficient, and more middle, militarily uh, efficient um, access to Asia and China could go through the, uh, the Middle East, but ultimately decided that that wasn't worth the trouble. And in response, therefore, in order to get to China, uh, they decided to try and go around Africa. And the origins of the Age of Exploration is in some measure due to the success and failure of these initial expeditions around Africa. So if you're asked in your exam about the Age of Exploration, note that my lecture went a little out of chronological order. Columbus responds to these initial attempts to get to Asia. But Columbus represents, in many respects, the themes that are, uh, that are common to all of these attempts. So these efforts to get to China lead Spain and Portugal, but especially at first the Portuguese, I mean, you could ask why, oh, they're, they're closest, uh, to begin exploring down the west coast of Africa. Uh, now, this is quite important for a future lecture on the slave trade, and we already assigned a reading, a primary source document, on the ways that uh, the, king, uh, the Kingdom of Congo will respond to Portuguese insertion into the slave trade. And so we are not uh, ignoring the significance of that aspect of these African expeditions, but we'll address it in a later lecture. For now, we want to emphasize the ways in which Portugal began to assert itself within that Indian Ocean in a way that would lead them to continue to try to expand outwards and continually try to find new ways and more efficient ways to get to Asia. So beginning in the middle of the 15th century, Portuguese voyagers began the process of going down the African, the African coast. Um, prevailing winds along Africa leads some of these ships to kind of be blown westward, leading to the, the, the quote-unquote discovery of some of these islands you can see here, right? The Canary Islands, the Camberde Islands, uh, but gradually inching their way down uh, uh, to uh, the Cape of Good Hope and hopefully around it into Asia, thus circumventing Ottoman especially, but Middle Eastern generally power and establishing European military uh, uh, locations within the Indian Ocean trade. I mean, remember what I said the Europeans need. They need quicker access, they need cheaper access, they need more efficient access, but they also want to be able to show what they could do, even against something, uh, a country as powerful as, um, uh, as Ming China. So, ultimately, it takes till 1497 for the Portuguese to round Africa, and the man to do it uh, will be uh, Vasco uh, da Gama, sponsored by the Portuguese king, Manuel, Manuel excuse me, the first, uh, who outfits da Gama with four ships uh, in state-of-the-art equipment. Da Gama will round the tip of Africa and continue up the east coast, and I have a map here of his voyages, until they eventually reach the western uh, uh, parts of India, which is kind of ideal. Uh, this allows da Gama not to directly challenge the Chinese, who could simply wipe them out, um, but could still assert the, 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 the presence of the Portuguese in the Indian Ocean trade and access to those goods in a new fundamental, fundamental way. It's important to recognize, however, that this process you know, already introduces the ways in which the emergence of European empire, the quest for new markets, 
uh, and the, the and European exploration more broadly were deeply entwined with violence. That all of what we're talking about in these first few lectures cannot be disentangled from a willingness by Europeans to use violence to get what they want. Da Gama is a great example. He was not, I mean like Columbus for the record, not a very nice man. Um, his first trip was 1497. Um, he runs into isolated resistance as he crawls along the African coast. Um, he fights with some merchants uh, and he you know, doesn't really come back with that much. Um, and yet, despite, you know, despite that, the king of Portugal is pretty happy. Uh, they now know they can do this, that they could use this route to get to the Indian Ocean, and he's richly rewarded. He sent back three years later, uh, uh, excuse me, that's two years later, uh, 1499, um, with 20 warships. So the first voyage is one of exploration, the second is much more one of conquest. I mean, you know, we've already seen 20 warships ain't that much in comparison to China, but for these uh, smaller, less centralized uh, uh, kingdoms and countries, uh, it is quite uh, uh, a force. And indeed, da Gama eventually arrives at the uh, Indian city of Calicut, uh, which he uh, conquers for the Portuguese. He gained quite quickly a reputation for brutality and violence. Uh, when he would arrive, uh, when he arrived at the harbor of Calicut, um, he boarded the ships that were there, proceeded to cut the noses, ears, and hands off the sailors who resisted him, and then burned their ships. The Portuguese quickly gained a reputation for being forceful we could say, as a euphemism in their dealings in the Indian Ocean trade. Uh, and excuse me, I forgot, I do have an image of da Gama's warships. The Portuguese, however, were quite successful in their goals. They were able to introduce a system that required ships sailing through their conquered areas to pay a fee. In other words, let's replace the Middle Eastern, the Ottoman tax, with a uh, Portuguese one. They integrated themselves into existing trade flows, which didn't really disrupt the already existing relationships of Southeast Asia that will come later when, Portugal, when Europeans are far more ready and powerful. And they were able to keep a portion of that trade for themselves. So they really got everything that they wanted. Well, I'll actually scratch that. Almost everything that they wanted. They got the access to some of these markets. They gained the military presence. What they didn't quite gain was the efficiency, right? This wasn't the most, uh, 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 the, this wasn't the fastest way to get to the Indian Ocean or to China. It is true, however, that the Portuguese success gradually leads Portugal to outpace Italy as the center of European Empire, or excuse me, of trade and eventually empire. But it's really only with the voyages of Columbus and the conquest of the New World, which Dr. Haynes will cover in a future lecture, that Portugal would become a full-fledged empire capable of challenging the most powerful states uh, of the world. And so for that to transpire, we would need to traverse the Atlantic Ocean. And next time, we're going to discuss precisely who uh, those voyages and conquerors will encounter. Uh, so we will see you next time. Uh, email us if you have questions.